So welcome. I am Leslie Anderson. I'm the Director of Collections, Exhibitions, and Programs here at the National Nordic Museum. And it is my great pleasure to introduce today's artist talk that's held in conjunction with the exhibition that has just opened at the National Nordic Museum, Levon Bell, A History of Unruly Returns. If you're in the area, please take the time to see this very powerful exhibition that will be on view through January. It's supported in part as today, today's program is by the Scan Design Foundation. After Levon Bell's talk, we'll have time for question and answer. And I would ask you to just enter your questions into the chat function of Zoom and, um, and we will ask them to Levon. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce today's special guest speaker, artist Levon Bell. Levon Bell makes visible the unremembered. Borrowing from elements of architecture, history, and archeology, span she creates narratives that challenge colonial hierarchies and invisibility. Bell explores the material culture of coloniality and her work presents countervisualities and narratives. Working in a variety of disciplines, her practice includes painting, installation, photography, writing, video, and public interventions. Her work with colonial era pottery led to a commission with the re renowned brand of porcelain products, the Royal Copenhagen. She has exhibited her work in the Caribbean, the USA, and in Europe in institutions such as the Museo del Barrio in New York, Casa de las Americas in Cuba, uh, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, and Christiansborg Palace in Denmark. Her art is in the collections of the National Photography Museum and the Vestiela Museum in Denmark. She is the co-creator of I Am Queen Mary, the artist-led groundbreaking monument that confront, confronted Danish colonial amnesia with, while commemorating the legacies of resistance of the African people who are brought to the former Danish West, West Indies. The project was featured in over 100 media outlets around the world, including the New York Times, Politiken, Vice, the BBC, and Le Monde. Okay. Bell holds an MFA from Instituto Superior de Arte in Havana um, and an MA and BA from the Columbia University in New York. She was a finalist for the She Built Project in New York City to develop a monument to memorialize the legacy of Shirley Chisholm and for the Inequality in Bronze Project in Philadelphia to redesign one of the first monuments to an enslaved woman at the Stenton Historic House Museum. As a 2018-2020 fellow at the Social Justice Institute at the Barnard Research Center for Women at Columbia University, she worked on a project about the citizenless Virgin Islanders in the Har Harlem Renaissance. Her studio is based in the Virgin Islands. It's my great pleasure to turn it over to artist Levon Bell. Thank you, thank you guys. Um, thank you so much, Leslie, um, for inviting me to do this exhibit. Um, I wish I was there to be able to see it, but I hope to be able to do that before it um, comes down in January. Um, and also again, you know, welcome to all the people that are here. Thank you so much for engaging with my work. So I am going to begin um, with giving a little bit of context. Um, I'm gonna kind of walk you through a little bit of my artistic practice and then kind of end with some of the work that's in the show. Um, so I'm from the Virgin Islands. It's a place that has changed colonial hands seven times, the longest being Denmark for approximately 200, a little over 200 years. And the last being the United States for the last 102 years, um, three years actually. Um, this is a picture of our government house, which I think gives a very good example of how uh, Virgin Islands identity is quite ambiguous. We have the Virgin Islands flag in the middle and we're kind of couched in between the US and the Danish flag. Um, in terms of my practice, I don't necessarily work in any one medium. Um, I work in various mediums and it's basic, basically dependent on um, how the idea will take shape and form. Um, so I've worked in video and installation and in public art, painting, drawing, um, and performance work. This piece, however, is one of the pieces that I think has shaped my practice um, the most. It was very much a turning point for me. 
In 2011, I purchased an abandoned building in the back streets of Christianstead town. Um, and this building kind of changed not only my life, but the trajectory of my work. Um, as I discovered the history of this building, being in an area of, of Christianstead that was formerly known as Free Gut, which is where all the first freed um, Africans were allowed to live and relegated to live by law. I didn't know anything about this history, as most people did not. Um, it was something that I, I learned and discovered. And as I renovated the building, I developed a different way to think about uh, the narratives inscribed in spaces and in objects, and also think about um, our built heritage as another kind of archive. Um, and so in some ways, this, this project, I would consider it maybe like a social practice project and incorporated uh, developing a uh, documentary uh, around the renovation um, and involved, you know, lots of events where I speak, spoke to neighbors and interviewed them about the history um, and just talked to them about th their buildings and the stories behind them. Um, this is a image from a plantation great house on the west end of St. Croix, which I did an intervention in that space in around 2011. One of the pieces that came out of that is um, thinking about this colonial chair, which is kind of the ultimate power chair. It's the planter's chair where the planter would uh, sit and the armrest would double as footrests. And then usually a servant would come and take off his boots because it was normally a heat. <laughs> and he would kind of luxuriate in the opulence of, the, of, of what was being generated by other people's labor in some ways. Um, and so what I had done with this with chair that was in the space is invited uh, people that came to the exhibit to sit in the chair and think about ways of situating themselves inside this, this history. And one of the things that I discovered very quickly was that it was a very gendered chair as you know, you had to kind of the way that it uh, you had to kind of sit in a way that you had to open your legs and it was it was I think it was interesting watching people how they situated themselves and how they positioned themselves into this physical space and also the, the kind of symbolic narrative. Um, here's another example of some uh, architecture. This is uh, in the town of Frederickstead, which looks very different. We have twin towns. So there's a town in on where I live on St. Croix called Christianstead, which is in the, in the Danish naming tradition of kings, there's Christian and Frederick. So one side of the island, it's called Christianstead and the other town on the other side is called Frederickstead. But Frederickstead looks very different from Christianstead because it had an event in 1878 called the Firebun or the Fireburn. And this was the largest labor revolt in Danish colonial history. And when it was rebuilt, um, it was rebuilt in an era where these kind of Victorian um, fretwork or gingerbread, these adornments on the building were very popular. And I thought, again, how interesting was it that the architecture held the stories and the histories, um, not just of the place, but also these stories of resistance and kind of a reconfiguration and a reconstruction. So I thought about doing, um, I thought about trying to develop a visual vocabulary around that. And the series I developed was called Cuts and Burns. And it's taking the architecture from the buildings and those patterns and making small cuts and burns um, in, on paper. And for me, the cutting and the burning was this, this exploration and a vocabulary of resistance. When we think about um, resistance in the Caribbean, we think about, well, when we think about the trajectory of the Caribbean, we first think about colonizers coming here and um, raising the landscape, the virgin landscapes to be able to transform them into colonies. So the first they would burn them and then they would cut them down. And then these tools, you know, workers and their resistance, that's those are the same tools that they use to be able to um, fight against the oppression of slavery and the, the conditions even post-slavery, like in the case of the fire burn in 1878. Um, so I thought it was, so I, I, I developed this series in thinking about not only developing a vocabulary, but also kind of another kind of archive. Um, when I had developed the stencils for the piece, because um, 
I wanted them to be even. I realized that as they were lying there, they also doubled this kind of writing. They looked almost like writing. So I've also um, have another aspect of this series, which is which look like long scrolls and ledgers. And again, I'm thinking about them as another uh, an alternative archive. The shape might look familiar. It's very similar to the shape of um, the house that I bought, which I converted into my studio. And a lot of the houses in that neighborhood have this very similar form. And for me, this piece is called Constructed uh, Manumissions. And again, it's thinking about um, it's thinking about these houses that come out of this historical period. As you can see, there's no real entrance or exit. They almost look like these magical houses, how, like, and you're kind of wondering how do you gain access into them? But one of the things that I had thought a lot about in developing this piece was that number one, there's no nails, there's no glue. It is very precariously put together because it's really thinking about how do people construct, um, how did they construct freedom? Um, and the precarious nature of it in the, the colonial period that I was thinking about, which is although they were free, they had lots of restrictions placed upon them. And so their home space and their domestic space would have had a very different meaning. Um, and I think we can extend that even, even into modern times as we consider what does freedom really mean um, and the, precari the precarious nature of, of that. This piece is called Trading Post. Um, you know, oftentimes when I work at my studio, I, I sit outside and I had a kind of a epiphany one day looking at these coral stones that were outside. And I wondered about them, like why were they there and not in the ocean? <laughs> and I also noticed that they had these very straight cuts. And at that point I had remembered a, a story that I had heard from a historian in which he, he had described um, that during slavery or during the, the, the beginning of the foundation of the colonial uh, landscape in, in the Virgin Islands that enslaved people would have been sent out into the ocean and they would have cut these coral stones and then these would have been the foundations of all the colonial era buildings. And then the Danish brick that had been imported would be what's on top. And so I found that interesting because a lot of times when we think about our towns, we think about them as these Danish colonial buildings. And when they're in ruin is when you begin to see these coral stones and the foundation, which for me really symbolize the, the labor, the invisibilized labor of the enslaved Africans. And also it symbolized the true foundation of these societies. So the piece I developed was called Trading Post, which was a plinth um, that took a lot of these stones that are around my property and kind of reconstituted them and you know, of course, when we're thinking about plinths, we often think about what's on top. And so it's this double meaning both art historically, but you know, thinking about our societies and how, how um, the, the, the foundation is kind of what holds everything up. And the foundation in this case would be the invisibilized labor of the enslaved Africans. On rare occasion, you see some walls. <laughs> and so this piece is, um, you'll see the, the, the coral stones on the left and then the Danish brick on the right, which is just a fascinating wall in and of itself. And I developed a series that was called Wall Rubbings. And it's very much thinking about that tradition of when you go to maybe uh, people who do rubbings of grave sites, this kind of act of recording and this act of remembering. Um, so I basically recreated this wall. Um, it's like, a, I guess it was about maybe 12 feet um, and it was very much thinking again about um, creating another kind of archive to this labor and another kind of archive to these invisibilized stories. I've also spent a lot of time going into Danish colonial archives. Um, this is an example of uh, my very first trip to Denmark, I think in 2008, I had a PhD student invite me to see what she was working on. And she had been working on these photo albums of people who had lived in the colonies in the Caribbean and taken these photos back to Denmark and donated them to the archives there. And she had been investigating them. And when I went there, I, I literally, um, I'm glad I did that at the end of my trip because I think I stayed there. It was like going into a rabbit's hole um, there were so many images that were so shocking to me, and this was one of them, um, in the midst of these Danish colonial officers and activities. 
they had this postcard that had been in many of these photo albums of this crying black child. Um, and it was so strange to me. But then I realized when I came back home and a few years later, I had been, I had, my mother had been ill and I had been going through some of our old albums. And um, I found that there was an image of myself that had looked very similar. Um, so up on the top left, you'll see that there's an image of myself that has a very similar composition. And I decided to think about juxtaposing those two images and then also going back into the archives and seeing if there were other images that I could find that had similar compositions. And I was able to find a few. So I'll just talk very briefly about um, some of these, but for example, the one um, on the bottom right is of, the one on the far right is an image from the Danish colonial archive. It was labeled as Obia Man Brown and Obia is a term used to describe people who practice African-based religions and spiritual practices. And my own father was um, a Moravian priest and then later an Anakin priest, but the Moravians were, you know, a group of brothers, brethren, I guess, that came to the Caribbean. And a lot of their role was to help pacify the enslaved Africans um, by bringing Christianity. And my father came from that first generation who was, that were black men that were being um, taught to be priests. And it juxtaposing those two images, I felt like you were able to kind of see a different narrative, not only in the ways that you look at the picture because you know, it's, you see that my father has a different sense of uh, presence and the way that he's presenting himself. But um, there still is this narrative, this kind of colonial trajectory of what happens to people when they've been kind of transformed, but how do they transform by colonization? But then how do they still in that process still are trying to find a sense of themselves? And I think that, um, I don't know if we have time to kind of go through all the narratives of all the images, but that's kind of, that was the purpose of that, kind of finding ways to juxtapose stories and then you're able to kind of see new things and also get a way to look at the colonial archive in a different way. So juxtaposition became a very important part of my practice, um, a very important tool. This piece is called Errata that I developed in 2017 and it was a response to a book uh, that came out in which I was centered. And as you could see, um, the house that I had been renovating, it's captured in the book. It was a very, you know, it was basically the author had been you know, writing about mostly the Danish, what's quote unquote, the Danish buildings. And she was intrigued by my interest in some of the smaller buildings that the laborers um, and the enslaved had lived in or formerly enslaved. However, um, my, in the book, she wrote that I <clears throat> had inherited the buildings and also that the, the first registered owners that are from the 1700s, they were African-born women that survived the Middle Passage, survived slavery, were able to buy this house in the 1700s, which is very rare, that I was somehow related to them. She said that they were my foremothers. Now, although that is, sounds like a very beautiful story, it's not really true. And I, I was, I had a, the, how I came to know this um, about the book was actually through another person who had gotten a pre-order of the book and they kind of, you know, brought it to my attention. And so I wrote to the woman who wrote this book, who had interviewed me and kind of started a series of emails with her, just opening up like, hey, I'm, congratulations on your book. I, I heard it came out, but, you know, I, I, someone brought it to my attention, there might be a mistake in there. And, um, she proceeds to answer me back saying, you know, she was on vacation, but she would check, she may have gotten some things wrong. And I continue, we kind of basically engage in these series of emails where um, over, the, over six months, where I wanna understand how she came to write these wrong things because that it really changed the narrative of my story by saying that I had inherited the buildings, by trying to make a direct unbroken lineage for 200 and something years between myself and the African born. It was kind of, I didn't understand it. Um, and it was very frustrating. It felt like a violation um, because it was a book. So I came to understand 
in the centennial year, there were lots and lots and lots of journalists um, that came to the Virgin Islands from Denmark and the other parts of Europe and Scandinavia trying to, you know, the hundredth, that hundredth anniversary was quite significant. And one of them interviewed me about this, this book and I was able to kind of correct my story. And I realized at that point that I had the ability to do that all along through my artwork. That my art actually, in the way that rock, paper, scissors, it could kind of penetrate the power of a book. So I developed an installation piece that was called Errata, where I juxtaposed the text with this correspondence that we had had over the last six months, all of our emails, in which we kind of try to understand how she came to write these things about me. And in that process, revealing a lot of projections and a lot of assumptions that Danes had. And why this piece I think is really significant for me and my practice was because it helped other people to see how archives are created. That an archive was being created at that time and it was wrong. It was based on lots of projections that someone had about who they thought I, I was. Um, and it was also a way that I could push back and talk back to the archive. So he, if people are interested in reading the piece, it's on my website. Um, these are just a couple of the emails. I had also started um, going back to these photographs and I kind of felt like the juxtaposition, although it was a powerful tool, I had been wrestling with these images and the power of them. They are so powerful and I wanted to try to penetrate them in another kind of way. And um, so I started another, this is a digital collage piece. It's called How to Survive Colonial Nostalgia. And it's also bridging some writing. So it's writing and text. It was developed to be an online piece. And what I'm doing is taking one of these images and I'm wrapping them around each other so that they're doubling as this kind of black hole, as this um, eye, they almost look like an eye. Um, they remind me of when I used to live in Cuba and a lot of people would have this, this evil eye, this protectorate image. And so I'm kind of just trying to think through about gaze and about audience and how to penetrate and transform the colonial nostalgia that's often kind of embedded in these images. Here's a, a little bit of the text and you know some of the other images that I developed. And then I realized that that wasn't enough <laughs> either. So I started really penetrating these images by taking the cuts and burns vocabulary that I had developed and beginning to cut and burn into these um, photographs and transforming them. And this was a, it was actually a kind of a, a scary process for me because I realized like, you know, the sacredness, like kind of the power that these images hold. And I was, I was completely I was being actually quite violent with them. The cutting and burning is actually quite a, a violent um, act. And so a lot of what I wanted to do was to help rescue these black bodies from this, from the, the power and the hegemony of these images. Um, and so this is a, a, a new series, it's called Swarm that I've been developing. Um, so this is an image of the Royal Copenhagen, which I had the opportunity, you know, the first time I was in Denmark, I kind of wandered into the store and uh, came across on the third floor at that time and had a museum that, um, you know, kind of just, it was like the, the, a museum of the Royal Copenhagen uh, pottery and, and things like that. When I, there was one, one room that literally had plates that went all the way back to the 1700s. And at that point, I realized that, um, you know, I had this kind of epiphany moment. Um, I realized that this, these, these pottery fragments that we call chaining, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and that's kind of um, it's very central for the exhibition, um, that these were the whole pieces that I was looking at, but I had never really seen them before. I'd only known the fragments. But I had imagined that they must have had plates developed around the Virgin Islands. So I was able to actually research their archives and find that they did have these plates. They had about a series of nine um, that had a very direct connection to the Virgin Islands. And I, instead of, so I reproduced them on paper plates to think very much about how uh, the Danish collect 
collective memory had thought about their colonial history, that it was very utilitarian in the same way that these plates were, that you basically use them and then you throw them away. And so it, it kind of doubled not just about, you know, um, what they kind of in, in some ways symbolically, but also physically did. Um, at the transfer, the, the connection between Denmark and the Virgin Islands was severed uh, quite greatly. Um, so here's another image. Um, I had a, a curator actually proposed to me to do another series like this or, or wanted me to replicate it or somehow. And so I, had, I went back into the archives looking for plates and actually came up with another series of plates that had been developed in 1834 uh, by the King of Denmark at the time. And it was a very luxurious and opulent gesture that he commissioned these artists to develop plates of his kingdom. And when you consider how much wealth was generated by, by slavery and colonization in the Caribbean, it was really amazing to me that there was only one plate in that 81 plate series that um, focused very directly on the Caribbean and it was a, a, a bay in St. Thomas. Um, so this is an image from a book that another Danish researcher had developed and had kind of helped me find these plates. And so what I did was I decided to develop a large scale installation. It's about 45 plates. Um, and it's very much, it's called On the Service to the Kingdom. And it's very much thinking about this process of imagine, like a colonial imaginary, how it's never really, it's like shifting and um, it's never really whole. It's like this fragmented thing that looks like a whole. But as you can see, there's all these different pieces and you know, this installation will never be really put the same, up the same way. It kind of constantly shifts. And then I'm kind of moving into, uh, you know, very directly the theme of the paintings in this exhibit, um, A History of Unruly Returns. And as I mentioned before, we have these colonial uh, era pottery fragments that you'll find them constantly resurfacing. I, I found this one outside of my studio. Um, as you can see, it's very clearly, uh, one of them is from the Royal Copenhagen, the other one isn't very clear. And you usually find them, they kind of resurface after it rains very heavily. And I found it such an interesting metaphor for this history and the legacies of it that just kind of keep resurfacing. But they also look like miniature paintings. They also had this kind of quality about them. And so I started developing a series of paintings um, but I want to mention first that in the Virgin Islands, the reason why they're called Cheney is because we have many uses for these fragments. We've, in, during slavery times, um, children would use them and slavery all the way up until the 1950s, which from what I've seen documented is that children would take the fragments, they would grind them and to make them look like coins, and then they would use them in games. And so that's the China for um, where you know this kind of fine pottery originally came from, and then money. So it's a hybrid word of Cheney, and that's uh, a term that I, I've never heard it outside of the Virgin Islands. But that's what we use. Um, that's what we call this kind of pottery. And then present day, it's very popular that people put them in jewelry. So there's like a cottage industry of, of jewelry designers that use them, and it's that actually is kind of quite controversial. Uh, not only because it's kind of created an industry where people go onto other people's properties looking for them. It's like this treasure that people now search for, but then also I think archeologists may have also some different opinions about people using them in that way. Um, so here's some of the work from the series, uh, A History of Unruly Returns. And these paintings for me, um, I call them my process paintings because when I thought about these fragments and when I'm, I thought about creating this series of piecing these fragments together in these larger paintings, one of the things that I had to realize or, or, or that's, that's evident is that I don't know the rest of the fragment. I only know a piece. And so I have to use my imagination to kind of figure out, well, how do I make them go together? And I thought it was such an interesting and beautiful metaphor to think about Caribbean societies that we have fragments of our European identities, our African identities, our indigenous identities, and we're kind of piecing them together to create something new. 
It's reflected in many parts of our culture, whether it be language, dance, music, that we're piecing together many fragments um, and creating something new. And it, it's also to me is kind of a, a way to challenge the absences of the archives. It's, you know, the, our imagination becomes this tool to kind of challenge the absences. There are things in the archives that we will never be able to recover. There's things from our past we won't ever be able to recover. But this, these paintings to me are, you know, kind of finding a way to, to transform them and to create something new. So I've, I've done, so I first have started off with just blue. The indigo color was, is kind of the most stable color. So it's the one that you will find the most, but you'll also find Cheney that do have some other colors and I've experimented with those. But recently um, I had a friend, you know, because people know I do this series, I have lots of people who send me images. I don't have personally a very large collection, but she sent me an image um, of this one. And I had debated including it in the exhibition because a lot of, for me, I think about the work as topographies, they're these kind of alternative mapping and they're marking and, you know, having a figure, especially a black figure in it, which transformed the series. But for me, I, for this particular exhibit, I thought I, I wanted to uh, push myself and dare myself to try to incorporate uh, this image. It's extremely rare when I sent it to archaeologists who've been working here for years, they all flipped. They were just so shocked to find this image. It's very, very, very rare. Um, and so I, I found a way to incorporate it into one of the paintings and, you know, I'm, I'm still processing it myself, like what it means, but I think very much about, again, this kind of, uh, this, these fragmented stories that are embedded um, into the landscape and into the, the history. Um, simultaneously, I actually have another um, exhibit that's in New York of a, of a similar series, but it's a little different. In the case of the one at the Nordic Museum, I decided to kind of spread the paintings out um, across the walls and even kind of, you know, abutting parts of the architecture. And this one is a series of paintings that are all very tight together. And they were created first as diptychs and then separated and then reorganized. And so what happens is you very much like the process of how Cheney comes. It's like the paintings were fragmented and then reorganized. And there's lots of these surprising um, connections um, between the patterns that, you, that you'll see. And then lastly, I'll just end with this story of um, in 2017, you know, it was such a journey for me from that first time where I wandered into the Royal Copenhagen in 2008. But when 2017 was coming up, I, you know, the Royal Copenhagen had done a series of a commemorative plate for the 50th anniversary. And so I had pitched to them to do and I to do a plate for the 100th that was based on my Cheney series. And, um, you know, so it was one of the things that uh, I wasn't able to do a, like a large production, but I was able to do a, a small, uh, what they call an Unica series, um, which some of them are imaged here. And I think it, it really, I, I saw what I was doing with these paintings in a completely different way, because the Royal Copenhagen used to be called the Royal porcelain factory, it's from like the 1700s, I think. Um, no, maybe the 1800s. It's a very, very old company. Um, it is an epitome of the opulence of the colonial period. It was created to um, give a gift to the, the princess of Denmark. And, you know, they have items that they create that sell for 300,000 euros. One of them they were working on when I was there. But what it felt like for me as the first Black artist in that 240 something year history to ever work with them, to be in that space, I started to understand myself as really an interrupter into that narrative um, in a way that I hadn't quite understood just making paintings in the Virgin Islands. Um, because here I am kind of interjecting literally myself into this history and this narrative and um, and I'm not caring that I'm mixing patterns from Holland or Germany or other things. I was, and I was really kind of putting my subjectivity into it. 
And I realized that that was kind of probably the most profound and most powerful thing. So I'll end with that and thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Levon. I want to open it up to the audience to ask questions. We had one, um, which you touched on in your talk. Um, and, and perhaps uh, I will start here. So you were born on Tobago, on the island of Tobago. You have practiced and lived for many years in the Virgin Islands, and you spent a significant period of time on the island of Cuba. How would you say that your work um, has been influenced by your experience in different regions of the Caribbean? Hmm. A lot. <laughs> um, I didn't spend much time in Tobago, but because my parents are both from, Bar my, my father's from Barbados and my mother's from Tobago, I had a multi-Caribbean household and then the Virgin Islands in and of itself is a very there are many people from the Caribbean here because it's a US colony. It's the only English speaking US colony in the Caribbean. Of course, there's Puerto Rico, but they speak Spanish. And so we attract a lot of immigrants um, from other parts of the region. But moving to Cuba and living there for four years, um, you know, it's the largest island in the Caribbean. It's also the only socialist communist island in the Caribbean, and it has an antagonistic relationship with the United States. It also doesn't have free speech. So going to art school there, the way that it impacted me was that most of the artists um, had to learn how to create multi-layered narratives to be able to express themselves and to be able to kind of avoid the vigilant eye of the inspectors that would come to the art school to check to see if we were doing things that were counter-revolutionary. And so my experience living there helped me to, and also being an, an outsider there, but a kind of an insider, because I was Caribbean, but I wasn't Cuban. Um, that really uh, helped me to, to really think about collective narratives, social narratives, and also creating multi-layered narratives in my work. That, that definitely comes out of my experience of living in, in Cuba. Thank you. And then we have um, a question that expands on an earlier question regarding your Cheney pieces. And, um, and so uh, the question is, um, um, She's interested in how you alluded to the collection of Cheney being controversial for archaeological reasons, as well as uh, people hunting for Cheney on, on others' property. Could you share a little bit more information about that? Yeah, part of the controversy is, is that um, in some ways, these are part of uh, our national heritage. And so what happens is that by putting them in jewelry, they're being sold off. So it's like taking part of our artifacts that are now being sold off. <laughs> so that's where the controversy is. But the other side of that is, is that it's really kind of an indigenous local gesture that we are finding new ways to use them. And so that's, that's part of the, the conundrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have another, another question from Joanna. And she says, in the US, I could imagine you getting pushback from interjecting yourself into a colonial narrative, sort of akin to the pushback resulting from the 1619 project. Do you experience that in Denmark? And um, does Royal Copenhagen welcome your influence? She says she's inspired by you restructuring the colonial treasures you find and making them your own. Yeah, I guess the question is pushback. Um, I mean, I don't think I interject myself into the colonial narrative. I am the colonial narrative. I mean, I, my last name is Scottish. Uh, <laughs> I have freckles on my face, you know, that I, I embody the whole being, my being of being in the Caribbean. My being is a part of the colonial story. I think what I'm trying to do is to um, so much of that narrative, especially in the Caribbean, has been projected onto us. And so what I try to do in my art is very much develop our own narratives and, and try to develop kind of a, like a possession of our own stories. Um, in terms of pushback, you know, there's pushback on both sides of the Atlantic, actually. Here in the Caribbean, 
you know, sometimes like, especially around the centennial year, people got tired of hearing about Danes and Denmark and colonization, even though we are living through it. It's, it's people don't necessarily want to talk about those stories. Um, it's painful. So we have a different, we have amnesia on both sides. Um, there was a huge difference between when I went to Denmark for the first time in 2008 to like 2017 or 18 when we erected the monument. Um, huge, huge difference. When I was in Denmark in 2008, I would meet people and tell them I'm from the Virgin Islands and they would go, you're from where? And that was shocking to me. It was shocking. Um, and I would have to, I would say the Danish, the former Danish West Indies, and they would still not, they had, there was very, very little knowledge about their colonial history. I think that a lot has changed. The centennial year in 2017, there was a lot of institutions that were dedicated to raising conversations. And then of course the monument, um, I am Cremary that myself and Jeanette Ehlers did, you know, got a lot of attention and it was kind of this interjection, very, a very, uh, large and prominent interjection into the public space, which generated a lot of dialogue. And we're hoping that that, along with other things, will create a shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Paul asks, in your piece uh, devoted to the book on Danish architectural heritage, did you consider how the author's error reflected um, perhaps uh, her projecting her own social experience and was an erasure of the struggle and pain of your heritage by assuming the property ownership would be continuous. Yeah, there was, I was very insulted by it because for many reasons. Um, one is that the building was derelict. It was abandoned and there were drug addicts living in it when I bought it. So essentially what she had also said is that my parents, my parents would give me a property that they allowed to get into that condition, which was absurd and very like my parents, you know, just came from this background of this generation of like very interested in respectability politics. They would never have a building that would be derelict with addicts living in it. So that was kind of insulting. Then there was also this assumption, like, did she not think that I could buy a building myself or um, and then the wildest one was this unbroken lineage, because if you understand home ownership in the Caribbean, most people lived on plantations well into the 1900s. This whole home ownership and middle class having their own, that's, that happens much later. And to think that the, we can have some kind of unbroken lineage from the 1700s, I think the only people in the world that can do that are people like royalty, like kings and queens with castles. It's very, very rare. So it was it was really this kind of fantastical narrative and um and and kind of careless you know because in the, some ways it's like it, I, my story was intriguing enough to treat it in the book but it wasn't important enough for you to check any fact checking or just send it to me your section you know there was it was this way of treating my story that i that was problematic yeah mm -hmm. Um, okay, uh, Diane has a question. Is climate change making life harder uh, on St. Croix today with worse hurricanes and sea level rise? Um, I would say that climate change is making everywhere <laughs> life harder, but the way, yes, of course, the way that we see it is not so much with the sea level as the, the hurricanes and the storms. And it feels, you know, we're not great producers of any great carbon footprint, but we are definitely one of the first to feel the effects and it's quite crippling. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Levon, um, for this really illuminating talk on your work. Um, and thank you for sharing your artistic practice with us today. Um, I really wanna encourage our audience who can to see this wonderful exhibition, Levon Bell, A History of Unruly Returns, which is on view through January or to connect with your work um, um, remotely through your website, uh, which has been shared in the chat function. So thank you again um, to Levon. Thank you to our audience today for this really wonderful talk. We appreciate um, that you not only uh, devoted your time uh, on a Saturday uh, to 
lend more information, to shed light on your work, but also working so closely with the National Nordic Museum on this exhibition. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.